Thanks for joining us in this celebration of the life and career of Richard C. Hotlet, who passed away in December of 2014 at the age of 97, just under two years after the passing of Anne, his wonderful wife and pal of more than 70 years. I wasn't sure that we should actually have this because I wasn't sure how Dick would react to it. Um, those of you who knew him knew that he wasn't very big on blowing his own horn for anything. Um, you had to pry information out of him, personal information, every once in a while. It would be something like he'd be talking about something and then you'd say, wait a minute, this, you're, you're talking about standing next to Adolf Hitler? And, and then he would say, and, and your plane was actually shot down while you were on this bombing run? And then he might tell you the story. But I think because we're also talking about good journalism, he would have indulged us today, at least that's our hope. I should mention the music, um, and Maria hodled it fully, uh, Dick's granddaughter, sent us um, a scan of a program that Dick and Anne uh, heard of a concert in Potsdam in 1939, and it was Mozart, among other things. And I looked on the internet, and the piano player who was at that concert was a guy named Edwin Fisher, and some of his work exists on the internet. So what you were hearing as you were coming in was some of what Edwin Fisher was playing at Potsdam in 1939, June, this was three, less than three months before the start of the Second World War. So uh, it must have been amazing for Dick and, and probably Annie to be listening to Mozart before there was some small chance the world was ending. I just found that remarkable. You can follow along um, with the speakers in your program, but let's begin today with a video retrospective of Dick Hotlet's career, uh, which was produced by CBS News. A storied era in broadcast journalism came to an end with the passing of former CBS News correspondent Richard C. Hotlet, the last of the Murrow Boys. Hotlet was one of that legendary group of correspondents hired by Edward R. Murrow to cover World War II, and he came with experience, including a 1938 encounter with Adolf Hitler. There was Adolf, bright blue eyes, and uh, he was another human being. He was pretty lousy at that. Reporting for United Press in 1941, Hodlett was arrested and held in solitary by the Gestapo for four months on trumped-up espionage charges. His war coverage for the CBS radio network beginning in 1944 included the D-Day invasion. He watched it from a bomber and provided the first eyewitness account. The Allied forces landed in France early this morning. I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of H hour. I was in a 9th Air Force marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. Hoddle had also covered some of the bloodiest fighting on the ground, including the Battle of the Bulge. Later, as he reported on the Allies' final push into Germany, his B-17 was shot down and Hodlett bailed out. The council resumes debate. In the 1960s, Hodlett served as a CBS News diplomatic correspondent reporting from the United Nations. The United States wants to bring the Palestinians into the Middle East peace negotiations. And his authoritative baritone was familiar to millions of listeners to CBS radio hourly broadcasts. This is Richard C. Hodlett, CBS News. After retiring from CBS, Hodlett shared his wisdom and experience with future generations of journalists. His advice to them, play it straight, don't tell them what you think, don't tell them what you feel, just tell them what you know. Will Russia bow to the great majority which wants Uthant or force a crisis? The time ahead will be one of sharp diplomatic struggle. Richard C. Hodlett, CBS News, United Nations. Uh, I'm Stan Cloud, uh, co-author with my wife, Lynn Olson, of a book called The Murrow Boys. Uh, Lynn, to her great regret, was unable to join us today because of a previous commitment, but she sends me with her full and unconditional proxy. When she and I first began researching our book, we contacted those Murrow Boys who were still with us at the time, Larry LeSueur, Howard K. Smith, William L. Shirer, <coughs> sorry, Winston Burdett, Mary Marvin Breckenridge, who used to call herself the only woman who also called herself a boy, and of course the remarkable Richard C. Hodlett. Before we began writing, we interviewed all, of, all but one of them, and most of them, several times. 
The only one we missed was Burdett, who was already too ill to see us and died while we were still doing our research. We had our first meeting with Dick Hodlett in a private room at the Century Club in New York City, where he had been a member for some time. Those of you who knew him will probably not be surprised to learn that Dick came totally prepared. He had a large cardboard box full of appointment diaries, scripts of some of his radio reports during the war, newspaper clippings, and dozens of photos, a good many of which were used in this book. I think it was that interview with Dick that finally and fully persuaded Lynn and me that what we originally thought of was a pretty promising idea was in fact a magnificent story that no one had even come close to telling before. The main focus of the book was, of course, the radio reports that Murrow and his boys made during the Second World War. To a man and woman, they turned in some of the greatest reporting of the entire war and of any war at any time. I don't believe there had ever before been so talented, brilliant, and dedicated a group of reporters operating under one roof, so to speak, and I don't think there ever was again. <clears throat> and Dick Hodlett was certainly a star among those stars. Oh, the tales that he and the others had to tell. Not that they often told them, mind you. They were too modest and too professional and had too much integrity to make themselves the center of the stories they covered. But had they done so back in the day, their stories, unlike some of the current stories others I could mention tell, would have had the distinct advantage of being true. <laughs> but Lynn and I were lucky enough to catch at least some of them in their later years when, frankly, they were beginning to feel a little forgotten by the world they had served so well and for so long. And so they told us some of their stories, although even then, Sometimes they needed a bit of prodding. So there was young Dick Hodlett, as we've seen, in 1941, at, a as a, at the time a reporter for UP, CBS, and his future, being held for several weeks in a Berlin jail cell while the Gestapo unsuccessfully tried to get him to confess to espionage. And there was Dick Hodlett reporting on D-Day, now for CBS, from the belly of a B-26. And there was Dick Hodlett after the invasion, riding in a B-17, that was hit by anti-aircraft fire over Germany and holding on while the pilot tried to maneuver his plane back to, into French airspace, at which point everyone had to bail out, including Dick Hodlett, who had never bailed out of an airplane in his life. <clears throat> and there was Dick Hodlett in the dense snowy woods around Bastogne covering the Battle of the Bulge, and there was Dick Hodlett interviewing an emaciated survivor at Buchenwald. Dick Hodlett and the other Murrow boys, and Eddie Murrow himself, of course, seemed always to be in the right place at the right time. And they were in the right war at the right time. And they were writers first and radio stars second, if at all. And they had the right stuff to make sense of what was happening and to make Americans understand it. After the war, of course, they ran into some difficulties, most of which could be laid at the door of television and its ever-increasing emphasis on entertainment over the quaint concept of public service. But even as they found themselves further and further out of step with the executives at CBS, they continued to pursue their calling, journalism, with the kind of dedication and professionalism that was personified by Richard C. Hodlett. And even in retirement, Dick was still broadcasting, now for the Council of, War of Foreign Relations, and still following the news <coughs> like the old UP news hound he was. I remember once in 1994, Lynn and I were to have dinner with Dick and Ann at a restaurant near their home in Wilton, Connecticut. The plan was that Lynn and I would arrive at their house by taxi, and the four of us would proceed to the restaurant in the Hodlett's car. But when we got to the house, Ann, answered the door and said she couldn't tear Dick away from the TV set. Come in and watch this, he called to us from the den in his unmistakable voice. You won't believe what's going on. They're chasing O.J. Simpson in a white Ford Bronco down some freeway in Los Angeles. <laughs> and sure enough, there was one of the distinguished Murrow boys sitting on the edge of his couch, absolutely transfixed by the modern soap opera spectacle that was taking place on, the TV, on, the, on his TV screen. We were at least 30 minutes late for dinner. Lynn and I occasionally saw Dick after our book was published, and he would sometimes playfully accuse us 
of having, quote, romanticized, unquote, him and the rest of the Murrow boys, even though we did our best to show them warts and all. We were just reporters doing our jobs, Dick would say, with typical modest assertiveness. We didn't think it was anything special. I don't believe that was quite true, of course. But remembering it emboldens me to paraphrase Shakespeare's Mark Antony. Here was a reporter. When comes such another? Um, I came to CBS News in 1969. I guess you could say I was one of the Cronkite guys who came after the Murrow boys, but many of the Murrow boys were still around, and in my first years in the Washington Bureau, I came to know most of them. Eric Severide was the CBS News Bureau's resident intellectual. Howard K. Smith was over at ABC, as was Bill Downs, who was my first competition when I had my first beat covering the Pentagon. I would often cross paths with Larry Lesseur, who covered Capitol Hill for Voice of America by then. Charles Collingwood was with CBS News in New York, along with producer Ernie Leiser, and of course, Richard C. Hotley was at the United Nations. Through the years, I've often been asked, what were these people like, and what were they like to work with? Well, as for Severide, it was pretty easy. For the first three years I was in the Washington Bureau, he never spoke to me. <laughs> I thought he was a snob, only to discover that he was painfully and truly shy. One day, uh, he happened to strike up a conversation with me in the men's room, and he expressed an opinion and asked me what I thought of it. Well, you will not be surprised to know that I told him I thought he had it exactly right. <laughs> and after that, he became one of my biggest boosters and one of my closest friends, and he was a wonderful man. That was not the style of Dick Hotley. By the time uh, I made my first trip to New York for CBS News, I had the uh, courage to approach him in the CBS newsroom, and to my surprise, he said he had seen me on television and asked my opinion on some story I had been covering. I was, number one, shocked that he knew my name, and number two, even more shocked that he wanted to know my opinion on something. Not many people thought uh, to ask me for my opinion in those days, and nor should they have. What I came to understand is that's how they all were. The Murrow boys became legends celebrated for the depth of their expertise and their courageous uh, analysis, but first and foremost, they were just reporters who thought the main way you found out about anything was to ask questions and to keep asking questions until you had it right. Even Severide, though I suspect he didn't ask quite as many questions as some of the rest of them. As Dick once said himself about the Murrow boys' coverage of World War II, we were not supermen. We were war correspondents. We weren't there to inspire or to explain. We were simply there to tell people what was going on. But of course, they were Superman because of the way and the attitude and the courage they brought to their task. What made Dick a great reporter was the curiosity that never left him. He always had a question when you saw him. He always had a tip to pass on. Every time he would come to Washington in those days, he would tell me the, the new ambassador to Guatemala knows a whole lot about Central America. You should really get to know him. Uh, and then the next time he would come to Washington, he'd have another name and another person that he suggested I give a call. He was always working on a story. He was always looking into something. He was always checking to get a second source, it seemed to me. In that way, that is how they all were. They, there was not a lot of small talk from any of them, but a lot of serious talk about the news of the day. They loved the news, and if they had any interest in anything else, I never heard one of them I express it to me. The war had been the defining experience of their lives, and their lives were never far from it. 
I'm not going into uh, Dick's biography and all of the various things he did. You've heard that. Uh, but I would just say this. He was just 26 when Ed Murrah hired him in 1944. They were preparing for the Allied invasion of Europe. But by then, as you heard from Stan, he had already become a seasoned reporter for United Press. They had sent him to Berlin because he spoke German. He was from a family of German speakers. But it was there that his, uh, his reporting so infuriated the Gestapo that they arrested him and kept him in jail uh, for four months. He became, as you saw in the video, one of the bravest of the brave. He never turned down an assignment. He always believed in the way you got the story was to get as close to it as you could and then report back what he saw. During the Cold War, he reported from Moscow, West Germany, later served as the UN correspondent for 25 years, which is a pretty good time to spend on a beat until his retirement, and he was at CBS News for more than 40 years. You know, I've often thought this over the years, that size is relative. I always remember the first time I went back to the house where I grew up, and I walked into the backyard, and I realized how small it was. When I was about this tall, it seemed as big as Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. But as I grew older and larger, everything became smaller. But that was not the case with the Murrah boys. These men invented an entire industry, broadcast journalism, and everything they did became the template for how we do things today. We have known all that for a long time, but as the years have passed and we have come to appreciate even more what they did, they have not grown smaller. They have grown larger. As journalists, we rightly hold them in awe. As Americans, we are forever in their debt because they helped us to understand and through that understanding defeat the greatest evil the world has ever known. Richard C. Hodlett was a giant, as were they all. Thank you. I'm Charlie Kay. I'm the executive producer for radio at CBS News, and I'd never had Bob Schieffer as a lead in act before, so it's a, a special occasion. Uh, I joined CBS in 1982, March of 1982, 33 years ago. Uh, I had by that time been a news director in New York radio for a decade and had been a reporter and an anchor before then. Um, but I had been hired as part of a group of people who were going to shake things up. CBS was going to create a second radio news organization. It would appeal to younger listeners who were listening to music stations on FM radio. We were going to do things very differently. We were going to have short newscasts, very high story count, very unusual use of audio and natural sound. We were going to concentrate on stories which we perceived would be of interest to younger people, stories about the environment, uh, the economy, and of course, entertainment. And we were told before we began, before we walked through the door, that we would not be welcome at CBS News, that what we were doing was heretical, that it was, it was so extraordinarily different from, from the mission of this news organization from its very origin, if you trace the origin to 1938 and the, uh, the Hitler annexation of Austria, that um, no one would cooperate with us, no one would work with us in this giant joint radio television newsroom on West 57th Street. Well, March of uh, 1982, we walk in the door. Uh, there were some people who were not as cooperative as perhaps they could have been. Um, but Dick was the exception. Uh, I was in awe meeting Dick Hodlett. I, I certainly am not old enough to remember his reporting from the Second World War, but I, I certainly remember uh, the crises of the Cold War, and he would be sitting in the UN Security Council, in a booth overlooking the UN Security Council, and he would, he would be explaining these, these difficult and contentious uh, issues. He was what I called one of the wise old men, the people I, I always uh, uh, 
tuned to as I was growing up as, as a kid to, to try to get some explanations, some understanding of what was actually happening in the world. I had great respect for him. And uh, I introduced myself. And he said hello, and we worked together. And he, he started asking my opinion on stories. And I, I was flabbergasted. I was just flabbergasted. Um, Dick split his day. He, he would work at the United Nations for part of the day, and then he would anchor on the radio during part of the day. On many occasions, he would also do a midday television newscast, a five-minute television newscast, just before noon in the East. And then he would have to do the noon CBS News on the Hour radio broadcast. So he would run out of the TV studio at 11.58.30, and we would hand him the script which he had not seen. And then he would run into the studio and he would do the broadcast. Occasionally he would run into the wrong studio, or we had changed studios at the last minute, and he would begin the broadcast, but he wouldn't be on the radio. There would be a sounder, the CBS News sounder, and then silence, and then 15 seconds later when someone grabbed him and put him in the right studio, you would hear, uh, you would hear Dick starting all again. Um, but he was, always, he was always good about it, he was always cheerful, and uh, people who have been in this business a long time know it is very hard to read cold copy, copy you have not seen before, which may or may not be in your voice and your style, but he always did it well. Um, and when I, Radio Radio was not an extraordinary success, this, this young adult radio network, and the longer we went, uh, the more we realized it was not, not going to be there for the long haul. The concept that somehow younger people could be attracted to listening to news on the radio on a regular basis um, was not really a winning proposition. And so many of us migrated to the other CBS News radio. I was one of them. I became uh, the morning editor at uh, CBS News Radio and did that for many years before I got into management. And I had a, a chance to work with uh, uh, Dick more often, and he was just a pleasure to work with, and so knowledgeable, and so gracious. There were occasions when we might not see eye to eye on how much airtime should be devoted to the Polisario in, in Western Sahara, or the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. But aside from that, uh, he was just a, a, a true pleasure to work with, uh, and it was such an honor for me. Um, this past September, on his birthday, my colleague Steve Putterman and I uh, decided we would like to take Dick out for lunch. So Steve, who was based in Los Angeles but happened to be in New York that week, called him up and we made arrangements and Steve and I drove to his home in Wilton, Connecticut. And we got there just before noon and um, I suspect he had forgotten all about it. He was in his uh, pajamas and his robe, but he was gracious. He, he welcomed us into his home. He was there by himself and offered us a piece of his birthday cake. And we sat around the kitchen table and we talked. We talked about the Moreau boys. We talked about the Second World War. We talked about his life. And I will remember that day until I die. It was just an extraordinary occasion. I really miss Dick. Thank you. I had the privilege of working closely with Dick Hodlett on the CBS News 20th Century Roundup in 1999 and many other projects after that. In 2001, Dick began a series of memorable guest conversations with my journalism students at George Washington University. From 2001 through last fall, he spoke with the students in every course I taught. And what he shared will be with these young people for the rest of their lives. He had great admiration for the reporters covering Iraq and Afghanistan. He told the students that World War II was like an orderly minuet compared with war coverage today. He characterized his own death-defying World War II exploits that you've heard about, like being held prisoner by the Nazis for four months, flying over Normandy on D-Day, and having the plane he was in shot down over enemy lines as nothing more than occupational hazards. Of Ed Murrow, he told the students, he was a great boss. 
He never told you what to say or how to say it. He simply led by example. And while most of us only know Murrow from his very serious looking photos, Dick Hoddle told the students that Ed Murrow had a smile like a sunrise. He was not a great fan of what he called the drip, drip, drip of the 24-7 news cycle today. And his advice to consumers of news today was, let the buyer beware. He always ended our conversation with the best advice that any journalist could ever receive. Start with being curious, he said, and never be afraid to say, I don't know. And as you saw on the video, don't tell people what you think, don't tell them what you feel, just tell them what you know. And exercising his very sly wit, he would occasionally add one additional pearl of wisdom be sure to keep the shower curtain inside the tub. <laughs> In August of 2011, just three and a half years ago, Dick Hotlett was honored here at the National Press Club with the President's Citation. I'd like to read to you from an article written about that evening by a GW student, Lindsay Underwood, who was among those touched by this man. I'm quoting now. Mr. Hotlett's original reports from D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge echoed through the ballroom as the awe-inspired crowd flew below the pre-dawn clouds, hovering above the fine, deep blue waters of the English Channel and over the barges of Utah Beach. Young scholarship recipients, celebrated columnists, and award-winning broadcasters jumped to their feet and waited with bated breath as Mr. Hotlet approached the podium. This sage of sound had every ear in the room as he shared the secret of his success. He leaned into the microphone and said, I tried. That was it. No frills, no fluff, just the facts. I'm Sam Litzinger, and I thought I'd make a couple of points about Dick, one professional and one personal. The professional bit is that I think you have to remember how important words were to Ed Murrow and the Murrow boys and Dick Hoddle in, in particular. When they were inventing broadcast journalism, they didn't have the sort of stuff that we have today. If you've ever seen one of those old wire recorders that Dick frustratingly tried to use from time to time, it's about the size of this podium and they weigh a ton and they don't work. So in the end, what you're left with are words. And First and foremost, I think Dick and the other Murrow boys were wordsmiths. And I thought just to capture a little bit of that, Juan, if you have that second cut queued up, this is a bit of Dick's report, one of his reports from the Battle of the Bulge. So it's December 1944. And I think to really understand it, you have to imagine yourself as being, what, in an Iowa farmhouse maybe, or a New York City apartment? And you probably have someone in the war somewhere, maybe in Europe. You may have heard about this big battle that's going on. And you're desperate for information. And you turn on the radio and you hear this. It's icy cold on the front tonight. And the mud on the roads and in the fields is frozen hard in wrinkles and folds. The men digging new positions in the fields have had to chop up the ground with their shovels and use axes. And over all, over ruined buildings and corpses and the wrecks of tanks and trucks, over everything, this late December chill has thrown a pattern of stress. Out in the forward position, men are lying in holes, beating their hands together, stamping their feet to get warm. And the ones who are in houses and cellars with stoves and something to burn know how lucky they are. It's mainly behind the lines that you realize we're building up for one of the greatest battles to be fought on any front in this world. Not a wasted word. And that's composed on the fly, basically. And you come up with something like that. It's just incredible. It must have been a kind of miracle to hear that if you were listening to CBS on that day. The second point is a personal one. Um, a few years ago, I got a package in the mail from Dick, and occasionally he would send me a book or something that he thought I ought to read and probably memorize. Um, and it was kind of a long package, and it was Wilton, Connecticut, 
And so I opened it up, and I'm rummaging around, and there's a lot of paper, and I get through. And finally, I pull out this, and it's a back scratcher. <laughs> and I was puzzled by this. So I called Dick, and I said, Richard C., which I just like to call him Richard C., and he, would, he said, Samo! It's one of the highlights of my life to have been called Samo by Richard C. Hodlett. And I said, thank you very much for this gift. And he said, you're welcome. And I said, why did you send me a back scratcher? And there was a pause, and he said, I thought you might need one. <laughs> and as it turns out, I did need one, precisely because Richard C. Hottlet sent it to me, and that's something I will have forever. I don't know what Dick's personal philosophy was, um, I, you may know that when he went to Germany, one of the reasons he went was to study Kant. Um, he was a philosophy student. The Nazis, of course, had other ideas when he got there, and they didn't want people studying Kant. So fortunately for us, Dick didn't do that. Um, he ended up doing journalism. But he was going to study Kant in the original German, which uh, is mind-blowing for any of us who've dealt with Kant in any language. So I went back through my old books and I found a couple of Kant quotes, and I think they apply to Dick. One is, dare to know, have the courage to use your own intelligence. And the other one is, it is not necessary that while I live, I live happily, but it is necessary that so long as I live, I should live honorably. I think Dick did both those things and that's one of the reasons we miss him. He was a great reporter and a great person, and we should be glad we had him. First, I'm so pleased to be here to be able to uh, listen to these stories about Dick Hodlin and to be able to share a few mem memories that I have. I think I met Dick Hodlin first in the summer of 1957. I was a relative newcomer to CBS at that time. My job was at WCBS radio, and it was from midnight till eight in the morning. And then somewhere in August, sometime in August, I got the liberating news that I was being sent over to Grand Central Station, where I think the television end of CBS operated on the fifth floor in rather gloomy environment and I was to be a writer there doing early morning writing then for television news programs. After I was there for a while, I began to realize that there was this very quiet, highly dignified, clearly intelligent reporter sitting by himself off to the side writing his script for a television program that was to air, I think, at 7.45 in the morning. It was 15 minutes, I remember that. And um, Hal Jerkel was the editor at that time, rather paunchy, and I remember him because he always wore a New York Yankees cap. That made me feel good. And at one point, as I was sitting there writing for somebody, Alter Kell ripped an AP story off the wire. It was bulletin. And he said, give it to Hodlett. And I picked myself up and ran over to Hodlett and gave it to him. Hodlett looked at it, looked up at me and said, thank you, and put it away. He picked himself up and then went and did his program. He led with the bulletin news. But I was left wondering, now wait a minute. I gave him the bulletin. He had already finished writing his script. How did he know that this was going to happen? So when it was all over and he came back, I summoned up the courage to go over to him and to say, Mr. Hodlett, how did you know that? And he said, obvious. <laughs> I said, excuse me. What was obvious? He said, well, if you follow the story, and then he just went into a wonderful kind of five-minute lecture on how 
if you followed it from here to there to there, you got to here, and all you had to know was that it was going to happen at that time. The rest of it fell into place, and he was able to do the broadcast. I did have the feeling, however, which I quickly must share, that I don't think Dick was happy doing that broadcast or working in that environment. Over at NBC, there was the Today program, and Dave Garraway was interviewing monkeys and having a wonderful time. <laughs> and this was CBS's contribution to morning news. It was Dick Hodlett, very sober, very straight, unfrilled, telling you what was going on. But I didn't have the impression that he was a happy camper. What followed the broadcast made him the happy camper, however. And he would pick himself up and walk from Grand Central about three, four blocks over to the UN. And there he would be among diplomats. There he would be among conflicting stories and ideas. People he would meet, ideas that were circulating that became stories. And he took a beat that is so difficult to make interesting, the United Nations, even at a time when in and of itself it was part of the news. But he made it interesting because he knew these people, he understood the undercurrents, the flow of international news, he respected the diplomat, he respected the process of diplomacy. And as a former diplomatic correspondent, I know that it's a difficult story sometimes to sell. And I think that Dick had many moments of frustration when he couldn't somehow persuade the executive producer of the CBS Evening News that what was happening at the UN was truly important. But Dick, in my experience, anyway, you've heard a lot of stories about um, sense of humor and laughter and all of that. That was not my impression of Dick. Mine was of a man deeply absorbed with the unhappiness in the world and trying to find out the reasons for that and trying to see if there was some way that journalism could somehow make the world a better place. My Dick Hoddle, that was the vision of a free man enjoying the rights and responsibilities of being a free journalist operating in a free country. Thank you. I'm Casey Murrow. I'm Janet and Ed Murrow's son. And uh, I want to begin by thanking Mike Friedman for um, really reintroducing me to Dick Hodlett um, as an adult. Uh, me as an adult, that is. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember him, uh, I remember Dick when I was a kid, um, when uh, I enjoyed listening to his voice when he'd come to our apartment in New York. Um, I enjoyed serving him hors d'oeuvres, which had nothing to do with Dick, of course. It was a chance for me to get three or four extra hors d'oeuvres after I'd made a circle of the room. Um, at that time, he was Mr. Hodlett, and it was such a pleasure when uh, uh, Mike and Sam and others uh, introduced me to him uh, as Dick, and I got to know him in his later years. For a number of years, I'd been a fan of uh, Lynn and Stan's wonderful book on the Murrow Boys, and I was particularly, uh, and thinking about today, I was particularly captivated by the last paragraph in which they wrote in, uh, I think, about 1995. Um, in 1993, Dick Hodlett launched America and the World on radio, on NPR, at the age of 76. Now in uh, 2015, who would have guessed that his career as a commentator and university lecturer would span another two decades? Quite remarkable, and he gave uh, a great deal to so many people in that, in that span of time. He was the last of the Murrow boys, but he was so much more than that. He was a skilled observer, as we've heard, a writer and reporter, and he contri continued to contribute to our understanding of the world um, for such a long time, almost to the end of his life. But everyone here knows that already. Uh, I thought I would add another remembrance. 
And that is how generous and kind Anne and Dick were to my mother, Janet Morrow, for many years between my dad's death and that of my mother. In their quiet and unassuming ways, they kept in touch, and more than that, uh, for which I remain still very, very grateful. What a nice man and grandfather. Reading my notes on an Apple product, uh, as I am today, um, it occurred to me that Dick might be amused um, at Apple's plan to deliver what is left of television to you and me while leaving radio alone for now as just an app. <laughs> Thanks to Richard C. Hodelet for all he gave to all of us. You know, as a child, um, we called him, well, we still call him Baba. He wanted us to call him Papa, but apparently children don't always get, get the letters right, so Baba stuck, and he loved that. Um, I'm not sure I know of any other grandfather called Baba, but he, he was Baba to us. Um, and he, when, once we were old enough to realize more about him than just the loving man that he was, um, he was a mythical figure, you know, enormous. This was a picture I loved to look at that was up on the desk. And, you know, I think he accomplished so much and saw so much that seeing him on the top of the world, practically, I have no idea where this photo um, was taken, but he, he, he loved humanity, and I believe his role as a journalist was an opportunity for him to, to give people the information they needed to do, to do the right thing and to be honorable. Um, can we go to the next one? Um, so, you know, we, it was very impressed upon me that he had seen horrible things in the world. But as, you know, a young child, of course, he didn't discuss any of these things with me. And this was a um, sketch that um, hangs in his office. He, from his seat at his desk, he could see up on the wall um, this etching by Kate Kollwitz, who was a German artist. Um, and he brought this back from Berlin um, because this artist was declared um, degenerate by Hitler and he was able to buy, as, as a US citizen, buy and keep um, some of these prints. But, you know, as a small person staring at this sketch, it was just horrifying and fascinating. And, and I knew that this was such a meaningful part of my grandfather's life, just observing um, the things that humanity allows to happen. Um, so if we can go to the next one. But, you know, when we interacted with, our Baba, with Baba at home, he was just relaxed and comfortable in his space. And, you know, we loved sitting on the, um, on the terrace, which when it was hot in the summer, he would spray it down with water so that it wouldn't burn our feet and the steam would just rise up. And, He'd wear flip-flops like that. Um, so he, he, I think he did have a really good sense of humor, especially with small children. He engaged us in a way that was just so, made it so easy to engage him as, as a grandfather. Um, so we would ask him, why, why are your feet so funny looking? <laughs> he had, you know, his toes, and between his big toe and his first toe, there was a, a big space where the, um, flip-flop would fit in. He said, well, you know I used to have six. <laughs> um, so he had incredible love and patience for small humans because I think he had such a belief in humanity and small humans are, are the people who who will, you know, follow us and, and make the decisions for the world. Um, but as everyone has said, you know, he, he was hard to get a story out of, particularly the dark stories. Um, he, he didn't really share with us. Um, but he did always keep learning. He always had so many questions. And as I was studying um, HIV and genetics and these, you know, biological sciences, he would have all kinds of questions. Now, now tell me, what? is a protein. And so, you know, we would be, start from there and he was fascinated and curious. And at the very end, we had, he had an iPad um, 
and he thought it was an amazing technology. He took a tour with my son um, of the Frick Museum, which was his favorite museum, um, which he would visit at lunchtime sometimes when he was at CBS. He would walk there, and um, he loved the paintings, and we stared at some of his favorites in the app. You can take a um, virtual tour walking through the rooms and pausing at the paintings you love the most. Um, and it was really, um, really a special memory. Um, can we go to the next? So the chaos of, of children was something he just loved the energy. Um, and he permitted us to, you know, he expected us to have good manners. Um, but he, he permitted us to, if we had finished our dinner, he permitted us to climb under the table and, you know, poke at his feet and tickle his legs and, um, you know, that wasn't really where we should be sitting at the end of the dinner, um, but he, he thought it was great that we were under there rolling around and having a good time because you can only sit still for so long. Um, let's see, so could we go to the next one? I want to make the point that everybody starts somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, he was one year old there, and then this, I think, is when he was graduating from high school. Um, and and the curiosity has to be there from the beginning. Um, he loved interacting with the students, um, and I think it was a great gift that Mike um, gave him the opportunity to interact with so many students over so many years. Um, because I think he, he wanted to um, contribute to planting the seeds of curiosity um, into the minds of the young, young people. And I, I asked him once when I was trying to decide um, what kind of a career I should have, because you know, that's what 20 year olds wonder. And you know, when your grandfather is this sort of mythical figure, and actually I was telling Marvin, he was, um, I don't, almost like Paul Bunyan, which I, I'm, I knew no one else in here would say that, but he <laughs> would work out in the yard and he would climb up into the trees with in a ladder with a chainsaw in one arm and cut the branches out that needed to be cut out. And he chopped his own firewood for his fireplace. He'd get start with a log this big, he'd tap in the triangular metal wedge. And like Paul Bunyan, into his 70s with a metal hammer would rise and down and split the logs. And it was just, I knew he was a smart man and he had seen so ama many amazing things and horrible things. Um, but when he was at home, um, he was um, equally committed to just working hard. Um, that doing what he did and doing it well was always important. But when I did ask for advice, um, what he offered was, when I asked, how did you decide to become a journalist? He said, well, and I was looking for some real wisdom here. I did the job for a while, and over time, I decided it was worthwhile. So you have to do something. You have to bring the best that you have, and bring your curiosity, and do. Um, and we all start somewhere. And little by little, um, I believe he built an incredible knowledge um, and appreciation of, of the world. Um, so I'd like to go, I think, to the last one. Um, so in his office where the Kate Colwitz um, sketch was, um, that as a child fascinated me. Um, last weekend, I was at his home um, and I realized the other sketch positioned that he could also see from his seat at his test is this one of ducks. He loved birds. In the previous picture, sitting on his patio, he had a bird bath. And what this finally meant to me last weekend was that even though he had seen all kinds of horror, he had this optimism and love of the outdoors and of humanity. And in order to deal with the horrors, 
He also focused on, on the beautiful things and simple, not fancy. Um, and it was, it, it really just finally clicked that the ducks are positioned up higher than the horror. Um, and so for his love of words, I wanted to share also because he had a love of words, but also simple words, not fancy words. A poem that he would recite to us from memory. He, he loved poems and literature and Shakespeare. But as a child, oh, this is funny. It'll make me stop crying. Um, <laughs> he would take me to a lake um, in, in Canada, Lake Nipissing, um, in Ontario, um, for two weeks in the summers. And there was no one there but us. And there was no television. And there was no electricity. And <laughs> um, he and my grandmother, their routine every morning um, was to get up and to go skinny dipping <laughs> into their, you know, 70s. And as a child, I knew my job was to stay in my cabin and not go out while they were skinny dipping. <laughs> um, these were the unsaid understandings, I guess. So much was unsaid. Um, but um, he would come after, after their swim, you know, fully dressed and ready for breakfast. My grandmother was making blueberry pancakes after I had picked one blueberry at a time for hours. Um, and he would recite every morning this poem, um, wake for the sun who scattered into flight the stars before him from the field of night, drives night along with them from heaven and strikes the sultan's turret with a shaft of light. And I, he began every morning with such optimism. Um, and I try, like he did, to do the best at everything I can. I think that's it. <laughs> now it's Pete's turn. <laughs> So you've, you've all heard the stories, the professional stories, the personal stories. And so I'll leave you with something that he used to say to us when we would, we would leave his house after a Christmas or a Thanksgiving or some other holiday. We would all pile into the car and it would be freezing. And he would say, so long, chums. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> and I think that's a good way to leave things. We have an opportunity today to correct a faux pas. Many of you have read the Merle Boys book. In the prologue to the book, we learn of the 1992 memorial for Eric Severide, which took place here at the National Press Club. And the prologue talks about the grandeur of the event and all of the iconic CBS figures who came and spoke and mentioned that standing in the back of the room, uninvited and unknown to the crowd, was Larry Lesueur. We're very pleased to have with us today invited, seated, acknowledged, and most welcome, Larry's daughter, Amy Lesueur. We'd like to offer special thanks to the George Washington University, to CBS News, to University of Maryland University College, and the National Press Club for their generosity. Our deepest appreciation to my colleagues, Heather Date and Kat Bug, for their many contributions to this morning's program. Our thanks to Casey Murrow, who traveled a considerable distance to be with us today, and to the members of Dick and Ann Hotelitz's family, who offered their unqualified support for this tribute. We thank you all. We'll have a reception at the end, and Mike can give you more details about that. But I thought we'd close with just 
some Richard C. Hodlett, give him the last word. Whatever you saw was a, was a fact, and there were good facts and bad facts, and bloody facts and pretty facts. This is Richard C. Hodlett speaking from London. The Allied forces landed in France early this morning. I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of H hour. I was in a 9th Air Force marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. Below us, the English Channel was a fine, deep blue. There were a few white caps, but we got the impression that it wasn't very rough down below. About five miles off the French coast, we saw a plane in a steep dive laying a smoke screen. Just about the same minute, a pilot said he saw fires on the shore. I looked as hard as I could, and there, down to the left, were some naval vessels. They looked like cruisers, firing broadsides onto the shore. Their guns belched, flame and smoke. July 3rd, 1863, Gettysburg. You are there. That is why military experts here at Gettysburg are convinced that this battle may be the turning point of the war. And here to discuss the possibilities of the situation is CBS News analyst Richard C. Hotlet. There has been an ominous silence over the Gettysburg battlefield since 11 o'clock this morning. Then General Slocum's Federal Corps regained its position on Copes Hill, the right anchor of the Federal line. However, General George Gordon Meade, the Federal Army commander, has not been deluded by this local success. He knows that General Robert E. Lee, the Confederate commander, has yet to throw the full might of his forces into a final attack. This is Richard C. Hottle at CBS News. West Virginia State Police have now recovered 56 bodies from the wreck of a chartered airliner which crashed near Huntington last night with 74 people aboard, including 38 members of the Marshall University football team, eight athletic staff members, and 28 other passengers and crew. Federal Aviation Administration investigators have found intact the DC-9's flight recorder and onboard tapes of the crew's radio conversation. Pope John Paul II has been operated on after being shot and wounded on his way to his Wednesday general audience. Uh, two bullets have been removed from his abdomen, and the latest medical report passed on by Winston Burdett from Rome was that... Stick to the facts. Uh, try to be as objective as, as, as they possibly humanly can. This is Richard C. Hottle at CBS News.